our study uh, with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful that we can open your word together. And we are thankful um, for the things that you have been teaching us. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's guidance um, and help as we continue to sort through uh, the judges and put them on a line. We pray that you can help us uh, to recognize our own sins and the way that we have failed to fulfill um, our promises to you and uh, fail to fulfill the role that you have given us. But we ask, Lord, that you can give us strength and help us um, to repent and be converted. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so yesterday we had placed um, the first three judges on a line. And I knew that there was something wrong uh, in the way that I had done it. I just couldn't remember. So I went back and, and studied a bit about Shamgar. Now, the way that we had looked at Shamgar in our initial study, because it's just one verse, um, the, the first point that we had noticed is that Shamgar is going to, to kill Philistines. 600 of them and um, that means he's in the west where Ehud he's dealing with Moab in the east and this is going to be about the 2520 in the east and when we think of the 2520 and we think of East and West, what does that remind us of? In some ways, it can be uh, something to remind us of the, the issues of North and South, but there's also the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay, well, there is that, but we know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Right. Um, and so that could that be that would that be more like those that were weeping for Tammuz that we would see in Ezekiel eight? Well, I would look at it as more as an increase of light. Okay. So. Um, so this is, for me, what we're looking at. If we're looking at um, Ehud as 2005 with uh, the message of the 2520, and then we're going to have Shamgar in the West with, I mean, just one verse. It doesn't give us lots of information. Um, we don't know who you know, what exactly is happening. He's a judge. We don't know how long he was oppressed or anything, but he's going to deliver Israel from the Philistines by killing 600 of them with an ox goad. And, and Shamgar means a sword, uh, but he's going to be using an ox goad, which is a pretty primitive type of weapon. Now, so what we had done in our, in our study of this months ago is we had looked at Newport. So there's Newport, New Hampshire, is where James White first uh, presented the newly pre uh, printed charts. And we know it's going to be in Newport, Washington, that we're going to have uh, the first disfellowshipping of uh, those that are are have part of the revival of the 2520. So how would we, how would we connect that? Why would we connect uh, Shamgar then to 2012? What because Shamgar comes with a very 
pointed message as you'd look at an ox code. Yeah. Shemgar also comes with a message of great light that is being rejected. Yeah. So it's interesting as, you, as you're making this application, because if we, if we look at this very specifically for yeah. 2012 with the time that, that this occurred, those that are in charge of this conference chose to make use of one that had come from the South had come up from California, Steve Walberg, to then be used as their tool mm -hmm. to go against this message. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that it wasn't greatly long after this that one came from the East that began also to subtly go against those that had been presenting the message. Okay. Well, I don't, so who's from the East? Don Frost. Oh, okay. He, he came out here from Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would deal with these directions, <coughs> literally. No, I'm speaking symbolically. I mean, the, the literal point, yes, but we have, we have one that comes from the South to attack this message. And then later we have one that comes from the East that does the same thing, so. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if I follow <coughs> that, that that's relevant, but um, I could be wrong. Um, so what I see here is we have Shamgar who's a sword and um, Is Shamgar a sword or is he the ox goat? No, Shamgar means a sword. Okay. Anath is an answer. So, so this, this judge is providing an answer, an answer to opposition. So, so we have the 2520 introduced under Ehud. Right, the symbols there, and we didn't go through it in great detail. Uh, but this is going to be uh, dealing with the charts. Um, there's, we didn't even deal with this whole part of the trumpet and the mountain of Ephraim and so forth. So there's a whole bunch there. We dealt with the ten thousand. We spent a lot of time studying that before. Um, so we we look at this as this message from two thousand and five. But now we're going to have Shamgar, and he's going to come as an answer to some kind of opposition. So it's going to represent the opposition, because from 2005 to 2012, there really isn't opposition to the 2520, other than um, uh, Eugene Pruitt. And, and his opposition is, is fairly weak. Uh, he's a single person. He had an encounter with Jeff, and he wrote just a, a pretty mild uh, argument against it, just that he just didn't accept it. Um, there was not really uh, anything going on. There was no sort of concerted attack against the 2520. So it's not until 2012 that you really have this all come to a head. So it's going to be seven years later. So this message of Shamgar is a response to the attack that comes at Newport.
Would, would that make sense? It would seem logical. Okay. And so we have this number, he slew of the Philistines 600 men, and we, and I don't remember that we really resolved what the 600 men represented. But he's going to slay them with an ox goat. So this pointed sort of message. And he also delivered Israel. Now, if we look at an ox goad, a goad also means to instruct or teach. So it comes from the Hebrew number 3925. So ox goad is Mahomet. But the number itself, 3925, means properly to goad, that is by implication to teach, the rod being an oriental incentive. Um, so it means expert, uh, diligently expert, instruct, learn, skillful, teach. So we can see that what would have happened in 2012 is we now have um, a response to the 2520 attack. And, and that does happen in 2012, which most people wouldn't be aware of. But what happens in 2012? So we're going to have in February 11th of 2012, Emiliano is going to write a letter to Steve Wahlberg um, against what they're, they're doing. But what also, <coughs> excuse me. What also happens in 2012? So we have this in February, February into March. Don't remember what day the actual disfellowshipping took place. I, I think you, you presented that before. I just don't remember. Well, like you're saying, we, we had this, um, disfellowshipping that went on we had a, a large meeting that went on yeah but just think about the rest of the movement so instead of thinking about newport what happened in the movement in 2012 the most significant uh thing i can think of 2012 what was jeff doing I remember the meeting. I remember the lessons that, that had gone on because they had done quite a bit in Arkansas. In fact, that they'd had before the meetings he had in Newport, he'd had um, Dario Taylor out to Arkansas where they, they covered several other points that Jeff later presented. Okay. Okay. I have to do this. My sharing's not working properly. Okay, so we're going to have Jeff. Yeah, he's going to do some meetings. But what about Habakkuk's uh, two tables? Didn't that start later that year? Not much later. <laughs> I, I think it's April. So in 2012, we have uh, an understanding of the 2520 that was not um, uh, clearly understood before. So we had the we had the the two 2520s, but what is it that we had lacked? Because we now have this new this new attack against the twenty five twenty in two thousand and twelve. 
So what what develops because of that attack? Anybody know? There we go. That's not proper. Okay, the prophetic mirror we had before, was it well developed until no. 2012? No. So it hadn't been well developed. And so we're going to see a new development in the understanding of the 2520 we're gonna we're going to to put together the prophetic mirror in a much clearer way so we're gonna see um uh the civil war at the beginning and the end is going to be much clearer um we're going to have an understanding of what happens with the charts the 1863 charts and and part of that is because one of the arguments they had against the 2520 was the 1863 chart. And, and this is what Jeff brings out in his meetings uh, uh, after the Newport Disfellowship. So he's going to bring out uh, the idea that the charts that he's going to he's going to present this idea of Newport, New Hampshire, where the charts are first presented, and then this disfellowship seven years later at Newport, Washington, and and he relates this to his initial uh, study regarding Ellen White's open visions. So she has her first open vision in Portland, Maine. And her last open vision in Portland, Oregon. Aren't those visions roughly 40 years apart? I mean, as I recall this being addressed, the last open vision in Portland, Oregon, was given not long after G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith had openly attacked both the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. I mean, Butler came out with his pronouncements of that not everything in the Bible is inspired and smith came out in teaching at battle creek that the when ellen white had an open vision then that was of god but when she gave her testimony that was her opinion yeah, so, that, yeah it's going to be june of 1884 that she has her last open vision Right. And that's in Portland. Um, now, don't we have record of her first open of, of her first open vision as well? Yeah, we don't have the the, the date. Um, okay. I think, but um, uh, so. So when she talks about her first vision, that's the where she sees uh, the Advent people on this path to the Holy City. Um, so when was that? Um, they don't really say. So somebody could look into that. But yeah, it's about 40 years. Um, I, you know, I think her first open vision was probably in 1845, wouldn't it have been? It wasn't still in 1844. It was in 1844. It was? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, 
It may have been very late 1844. Yeah, December of 1844. So it was, uh, she was in Portland, Maine. Yeah, so so it's about 40 years. I mean, it's a bit less, but. Um, well, okay, let's, let, let's look at this on a different level. Okay. December of 1844 to June of 1884. Yeah. That's roughly 39 years, six months. Mm -hmm. Could 39.5 have been in relation with 391.5? Um, I don't know if I'd make that connection. Okay. Uh, why not? Because it just doesn't fit to me. Um, I'm just saying I wouldn't do it. It's 39, not 391. Okay. Yeah, so... trying to find this here yeah so um uh so interesting part here i'm just looking at what i was trying to find um having obtained a large trunk of full of finished charts wrote james white we left maine october 21st for the newport new hampshire meeting by way of boston um and that's uh November 10th, 1863, that he wrote that. So, so it's going to be in um, New Hampshire at this Newport um, camp meeting, series of meetings, where he's going to first be presenting the charts. So what Jeff had done is he had connected 1863 with, with the attack against this message because of the 1863 chart. He starts to develop this understanding of the connection between Newport, Washington, just as he did with the Portland, uh, Oregon and Portland, Maine connection. So we have this East and West connection of the United States in, in both these instances. So what would be the significance here as we're looking at Shamgar? Because he's going to be in the West, Ehud in the East. So would this be an increase of understanding of the 2520 with Shamgar being a new emphasis being introduced? That could be. Okay. So in 2012, Jeff is going to, when he presents, excuse me. When he presents Habakkuk's two tables, he's going to give a more comprehensive outline of the prophetic mirror than he had previously. And what's going to happen is we're going to, uh, I think for the first time, look at Jericho. <clears throat> that is the rebuilding of Jericho in connection with 1863. So we're, start, we're going to look at the 1863 chart in more detail. Now, what, what, it, what results from that? I don't know if people remember the history of this movement, but we did go over it. What results from the, the closer examination of, of Habakkuk's two tables? Is that your question? Well, well, in Habakkuk's two tables, he presents 
1863 right with its connection to jericho so that is the death of james and ellen white's two sons the oldest and the youngest so that's going to be that's going to be presented and that the understanding of jericho is it's the seven times so there's a rejection of the seven times so we develop uh both the end of the prophetic mirror and also the beginning of the prophetic mirror in a bit more detail we start to understand it more clearly than we had before we had put together the prophetic mirror but we hadn't really understood the significance of it and especially a lot of the mirror aspects so it, in 2012 is when i pick up uh, the 2520 and i start presenting the prophetic mirror um and that's going to be one is i had gone to uh uh, in 2011, I had gone to Emiliano's camp meeting and and first started to understand the 2520. So I'm going to be developing my understanding of it. But when I, I developed the prophetic mirror based on what Jeff had presented, um, we have um, a clear understanding of the significance of the 1863 chart itself. That is... We, we begin to notice that there's 2,604 years and that this is uh, significant. We also notice that on the 1863 chart that the 2,604 years is represented. And that's going to be represented in the week of Christ. So the week of Christ on the 1863 chart becomes more important in understanding. Now... We had a view, and, and Jeff was part of this view, is that the 1863 chart was the image of jealousy. Right. Okay, and that's not incorrect, but it's also um, God has in that chart hidden things for us to understand. So there's nothing wrong with the 1863 chart. You can't point to it and say it has some error. It's what doesn't exist on it uh, that would be the problem. But is is this 1863 chart then a symbol of the first generation of Adventism? Yes, and their rejection of uh, the first and second angels' messages. Their rejection of foundational understandings, right? Yeah. Now, the key to the prophetic chart is rather interesting because Uriah Smith wrote it. And in there, he still has 677 BC for the rise of Babylon. So he, has, he hasn't attacked the chronology of the 2520. Right? He doesn't get rid of that. Um, but he also does not have the 1260 or the 1335 or the 1290, either on the chart or in the prophetic key. So, now why that is, I mean, partly the chart was meant to be, uh, to take the visual images from the 1850 chart and put them on a larger chart without the, the written uh, explanations. And that these would be put in a book. And we remember that Joseph Bates, uh, when he sees the chart, his response is to quote from Isaiah. And, and James White's response to it is rather interesting as well, um, to, to Bates. Because <coughs> he calls Bates' opinion apocryphal. And um, that verse <coughs> uh, is written in a table noted in a book. That's Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not. Unto us write things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. So, so Joseph Bates notes this, and, and different people have an interpretation of, of what he's actually saying. 
um, um, Tanya took it as if, uh, you know, Joseph Bates was just jesting. Um, I'm not sure how she got that. Uh, um, you're saying Tanya as in Tanya Beeman? Yeah. She didn't like my interpretation of what Joseph Bates was saying. I took it that Joseph Bates was being um, re rebuking the 1863 chart, but in a uh, in a way that was not offensive. That is, he wasn't impressed with the 1863 chart, and that he believed that this verse is for people who aren't interested. It shows that those they aren't really interested in prophecy. So he sees it negatively. She thinks he sees it po positively. Um, so that he's accepting the 1863 chart. That's how she interprets what Joseph Bates wrote. But I'm saying that he's he's rebuking them, but in a way that's not upfront. He he's saying that that Adventism is a rebellious house. That's the way I interpret what Joseph Bates says. But I mean, it's it is open to interpretation because I have to read between the lines. On the surface, it looks like he's accepting the chart, but I'm taking what he's saying um, uh, by reading between the lines, which is something Tanya couldn't do, which is why I bring her up because she's just a literalist. So she just takes what's being said on the surface. But there's something underneath it, and especially in James White's response that, that Joseph Bates' view is apocryphal. He doesn't really accept it. So they're friends communicating with each other uh, in, in the Adventist Review in, in the way that they can understand what they're saying, but other people may not. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I would say that this is what the 1863 chart is. That it is still from God, but it's for a rebellious people that does not want to hear prophecy. Right? They don't want to hear the law of the Lord. And so God gave it as a witness, but within the 1863 chart is hidden the 2520 and the whole prophetic mirror. So we're going to have in 2012, um, uh, we're going to have this increase of light. Now, we also in 2012, Parminder is going to present um, time setting. Right. And that's going to be around this time as well. So a lot's happening in 2012. You have the disfellowshipping in Newport. You have um, Dwayne Dewey is going to present uh, the desolation of Jerusalem. What's happened? What was how Adventism uh, left uh, Miller's rules and became uh, part of the Protestant uh, understanding of how to study Scripture, how that scholarship um, affected Adventism. You're going to have Habakkuk's two tables. You're going to have, and it's in like the end of March, Parminder's going to present the idea that the Sunday law is going to come in 2014, which Jeff is going to call out as fanaticism. And he writes a paper, which he's going to later present in 2018. So, so 2012 is really a pivotal year for this movement. In a way of speaking, would you say that 2012 was a watershed year? Yeah. Yeah, things go in different directions. And, and it's going to lead to all the things that are going to follow. Um, the different groups leaving, uh, the development of the 2520, which I'm a part of, that is, in 2013, because of the study that we had done on the prophetic mirror, and Jeff begins looking at uh, 
the seven, the number seven, so the seven thunders, and he looks at this in the different um, kings of Judah, the kings of uh, Persia, etc. cetera. Um, so we start to develop this understanding that starts to go back much more to chronology. And um, we're going to end up with the understanding of the four seven times. So in 2013, um, we now have an idea that there are uh, periods of time and that Leviticus 26 is not just talking about the 25, 20 years. When it addresses literal Israel, it's addressing periods of 70 years and 140 years in a 220 year period. And so that becomes developed in 2013, 2014. So if we're going to talk about Shamgar, it's going to be an introduction of a new understanding of the 2520. And, and many of these groups that were a part of this movement do not accept uh, our understanding of the 2520. I sometimes will interact with people who still are promoting the 2520 and uh, they don't accept what we say. Some of them don't even accept the prophetic mirror. There are groups that only want to have Miller's 2520. That's it. So, uh, and people may not realize how much resistance there was uh, to our understanding of the 2520, not just outside, but even within the movement itself. Uh, many of the people who have left the movement uh, since 2012 uh, did not accept any new light on the 2520. Either the prophetic mirror, I mean, I know people personally who were in this movement up till 2017, but never accepted the prophetic mirror the 2,604 years, the 225 20s together and what they produced, or the understanding of the, the rebuilding of Jericho and things like that. And, and one of the reasons they didn't accept it is they didn't want to have any time after 1844, right? So when we had 1863 as part of the prophetic mirror, one of the, one of the problems that we had is we now had a date that in a sense is predicted uh, based upon an understanding of a prophetic structure that goes beyond 1844. Do you understand the significance of that? What does that do to this movement? Doesn't it begin to add a focus to the importance of chronology? Right. And it puts time after 1844. So when we start to accept time setting, what we can see is that we have time in our movement already. And because we had 1863, um, which we had, we already had, in 2000, we had that before 2012, we had 1863, we had partly the prophetic mirror, but not the full significance of it. That's why we could count the 126 years from 1863 to 1989. And then Parminder could count from 1888 to 2014. But take those two as representing this whole structure of 151 years and then uh, say that the Sunday law was going to be, uh, begin in 2014. And in some ways, Parminder wasn't wrong. I mean, he was right about the structure. It was his interpretation of what Sunday law it was talking about. And he was looking for the literal Sunday law in the United States, not understanding the symbolic nature of these lines. So one of the things we can say about um, the understanding that was developing on the 2520 and the time that we had after 1844 at until Parminder came along, we never predicted anything in the future based upon the structures. 
right? So we would look at a date in the past, like 1989, and we would say, well, we just noticed this structure after 1844 that has time attached to it, but we're not predicting anything in the future. So when Parminder predicted something in the future, he was wrong, right? In the, that the event he predicted was wrong, but he, he was correct in what he did, right? The structure was correct. Now, Parminder and Tess tried to argue that a Sunday law did occur in 2014. Now, how did they do that? Anybody remember? No, I don't. Well, all I knew is that it made no sense because there was no Sunday law in 2014, but they insisted that there was. And, and that, to me, didn't sit very well. I mean... He just says there was a Sunday law in 2014. Well, where is it? And, and they never could tell us where it was. So I found that rather puzzling. So there was kind of this cryptic answer if you asked him the straight question. But the thing is, Jeff said that you can't have a Sunday law in 2014 if you're comparing it with 1888, because is there a Sunday law in 1888? You have the Blair Bill. But do they, they pass, do they pass a Sunday law with the Blair Bill? No. No, so why would you look for a Sunday law? You could maybe argue that a Sunday law could have been thwarted, but you couldn't argue that there was a Sunday law in 1888 and that you wouldn't expect a Sunday law in 2014. What was marked in 2014 was the first major separation that this movement experienced with all these ministries leaving, leaving basically Future for America on its own. So none of the other ministries continued with Future for America. And, and that's what's being marked. So we would need to understand then what really 1888 represented. And it is a rejection of a message, is it not? So in 2014, you have a rejection of a message. So Parminder predicted the wrong event by predicting a Sunday law. So one of the things we learned from Parminder's prediction is that we can't predict events. We can, we can note the time, we can measure the time, but when we actually come to, it's not until we pass that time, can we know that it was the correct time and understand what it meant. Now, as far as the 600 men, we looked at the fact that six is an overplus, right? So when you look at, at numbers in Hebrew, how do they normally do numbers? Anybody know? I'm trying to recall your statement. Well, so we have numbers in Hebrew. We have these 600 men. And when we look at numbers in Hebrew, they're numerals. Um, we would normally just have Aleph for one, Bet for two, um, Gimel for three, Dalit for four. They just use the Hebrew alphabet. So six would be Vav, right? That's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But here they're going to use this word um, um, for six that's going to be Shisha. So 
So what, which it means an overplus beyond five or the fingers of the hand, right? So we have this, this word. Why wouldn't they just use a vav? So they're, so they're using a system of numbering here that has symbolic aspect to it. So they could have written these numbers differently. Um, so let me see here. But they chose to present that which they were seeing. Yeah. And they often do this in Hebrew. They use this. So they could have used what we would more often. It's just like we will use the word six or we'll use the numeral six. But here they're going to not use the numeral six. They're going to use the word six. Right? That's what they do. And, now, and they're going to do that consistently throughout the Bible. I'm just looking here. Pretty much that's what they do. But if we use this, this six, it's an overplus. So what's an overplus? What, does, what would be the significance of, of six being beyond five? What, what is that going to symbolize? I don't have a direct answer for you. Okay, so you have, what's five represent? Five wise, five foolish. Okay, so the five wise, five foolish. So if you have six, what's that? Well, six is the number of man. Okay, it's the number of man, because he's made on the sixth day. <coughs> So would this be man um, going above, trying to go above what God has given? Because these are the Philistines. There's 600 men. Or is this Shamgar taking down the, the men that would seek to have dominion over God's people. Okay. Well, yeah, but it's a message, right? So right. this is a message. This is an understanding. Um, if you have an overplus, I mean, this would be what what we have encountered here with Shamgar is basically a conflict between scholarship and Miller's rules. Right. Okay, that's what the 2520 really comes down to. Now, okay, is it is it just a conflict between scholarship and Miller's rules or is it a conflict between God's rules and man's rules. Well, yes. Because scholarship me. is the attempt to show how intelligent man has become without a need of reliance upon God. And Miller's Rules points out our total and utter need for reliance upon God. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, so this 600 men, this would represent what I believe it represents is it represents this, what, what occurs from the 2520 is this 
interaction with modern scholarship and and Miller's rules. That's where the battleground is. It's Jesenius saying um, that um, the word Sheba is an adjective, which, you know, there's no reason for him to say that. It, it's a noun. But this was this was a, not a man of faith. Oh, I know. And and, it, and it's just an opinion that he had that it must be an adjective, which is not not the consensus opinion, even among scholars. But in this in this situation, when we <clears throat> when we look back at the time that Uriah Smith was beginning to develop as a person, he chose to give more reliance upon man than he did upon scripture. Right. Yeah, so as we start to look into the 2520, for me personally, it becomes uh, very clear that we're not, that the, that the scholars are not gonna be interested in how we're studying because everything that we do is completely different than what they do. Right. We have man's opinion. Somebody said something. It must be true. Even though different people say different things, you pick the ones who say the things that you agree with. Um, but also, the the basic thing that I found when I became an Adventist, uh, I read uh, the introduction to um, the SDA Bible Commentary, boarded from the church library, and. Uh, um, one of the things they they make clear is how we study the Bible. And their view was that we can't look at the Bible mystically. We can't look at, because the rabbis, what they use is this bad example of the rabbis, where they, in a sense, are doing what we do. They will look at some verse and find something in it that it's not saying on the surface. And... But these are based on man's speculations. So, so they use these bad examples of Bible study and just say the only thing we can do is look at what the Bible says on the surface and what's, what would be understood by the people who heard the Bible. And we can't find anything hidden in it. So the idea of finding things hidden in the scriptures is basically forbidden by modern scholarship and that scholarship had been adopted the very way that we could look at Shamgar and say well this applies to you know 2012 I mean they would just look at it as absurd yet we see this in the spirit of prophecy we see Ellen White taking histories in the Bible and comparing them to events that are contemporary with herself and, and it's not just that it's an example of what a, a certain situation is, that the story sets up a principle, but she will tie together it basically on a line that that event is parallel. So she talks about delineation of prophetic events and the delineation means to set upon a line so ellen white is studying the bible and history as prophetic lines this is basically the truth that jeff came to understand now the rabbis may have gone off on all, all different kinds of tangents as a counterfeit of what god has set up but it doesn't mean that you can't find things in the scriptures that are hidden. So when we look at something like Ezra 7 to 10, and we see this, um, we draw this on a line, and we see these dates of three, you know, these periods of three days, and we create a chiasm, and we find the day of Pentecost is in the center of one, and the day of atonement is in the center of another. Um, Modern scholarship cannot do that. 
right? They can't take the story of Joseph and look at the structural chiasms that are there and have not see any significance in it. They don't wish to look for symbols. Mm -hmm. They wish to look only at a, let's say, a, a reiteration of a story and then leave the symbols completely alone. Right. So in this movement, with the 2520 and its development, it becomes really clear that we are diverging um, from any type of modern scholarship, that this movement is based upon a different foundation. And that many people who are in the movement are unwilling to follow that, even to the point of, of 2020 on December 6th, 2020, people who were involved in the prediction of July 18th now recant of the, the use, symbolic use of dates. So they basically have rejected all of this message. They've rejected the 2520, right? You can't have any time after 1844. So you're going to reject 1863. You're going to reject the prophetic mirror. Yeah. The precious hidden jewels of truth we find by digging for them, Ellen White says. Uh, thanks, Ron. You know, it's very clear that there are things in the scriptures that are hidden and that can't be understood through the methods of modern scholarship. So we now have this key with the 2520 that we see in the story of Ehud and that key is going to open up an understanding of the 2520 that we see beginning with Shamgar. But in a situation like this, um, as we were as we were speaking about yesterday, mm. we we can see some applications of in the in the first of the judges an image of jealousy in the second we have the secret chambers. And then with this, there could be an application of reliance upon man's wisdom, which we could then place as we were in, in Ezekiel 8 as another type of weeping for Tammuz. Okay, well, I don't know. That's not, uh, I, know, I know what you're saying about Ezekiel, but I don't know if I, I really would place this all here. Uh, um, so we're going to have uh, 2012 here. So you can see me fine. Yeah, you're uh, coming, coming through fine. Okay. So we have um, the seven years here and so we have with Othniel, we have the work of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> the sprinkling of the latter rain. Then we have Ehud, which represents the 2520. So you have the Holy Spirit here. And of course, the Holy Spirit teaching about prophecy. And then you're going to have the 2520. And then you have these seven years. So we can we can look at this as you know Newport, New Hampshire, and this is going to be uh, New, uh, Newport, uh, Washington. So it's going to tie this together. Um, so this is going to be Shamgar. So this is going to be this. 
but is the understanding of the prophetic mirror. And this, this understanding of the prophetic mirror is going to lead uh, to, one, there's going to be more things that are going to be attacked. But we can see in this progression that God has been giving us a greater understanding of biblical chronology and the use of chronology uh, in our time. And that's going to be because of what happens at 9-11. So this progression is these first three judges. Any, any thoughts about this? Since we have this five to begin with, are we looking at that as the five foolish rather than the five wise and then the seven being a departure from the understanding of prophetic interpretation that was given by Father Miller? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, the five and the seven... We see this in other structures, five years and seven years, but I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I mean, we're going to have 2014, right? Right. That's going to be the next uh, judge. So we'll see what that that's about. But yeah, so we see this kind of structure in the story of Joseph. Right. The seven and the five, the two. But we, we will come to that later. But anyway, that's the correction that we needed to make from yesterday's drawing of this. Okay, so when we go to chapter four now, we're going to deal with Deborah and Barak. So we know that this is, uh, this story is going to deal with Parminder's errors coming into the movement. Now, Parminder predicted 2014. So when we looked at this before, um, I think there's things that we missed that we're going to have to address. Um, so the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera. So we're going to say that this is a papal understanding and that Sisera represents Parminder's message. So why did we say that Jabin, king of Canaan, represents the papacy? Why is this a papal understanding that's coming that's that this movement has is having to address? Well, if it's coming from Canaan, is it not coming from the east? Oh, well, Canaan, they're in the land of Canaan. Right. <clears throat> so this is an internal enemy. I don't know. Canaan is the whole area of Palestine. So I don't know how it's the east. But it would be an unconquered area. Right. So this is a, an enemy that was unconquered that they now have to. And, and they had these different groups, you know. Um,
I guess the, the one thing, and I, I'll just put this out there directly, is I, I, I'm still looking at this as another representation of four generations. Okay, so you're, you're trying to parallel these first four judges with four generations. Right. Okay, so would we apply these then? I don't know how we could do that. I mean, I can see, because if we're dealing with the four generations, we would have to line this up with the four generations of Adventism. Well, I'm, what I'm also saying is when we're applying that you know, as four generations and we make the application that we see in this with Ezekiel 8, we then later come to a situation where this message must go back beginning at the leadership and go through Jerusalem. But it begins at the house of the Lord. So the, the four generations, as, as I'm looking at it and as had been presented by Elder Jeff, the first of the, of the judges deals with a situation regarding jealousy, the image of jealousy. The second, dealing with um, the, the very fat king is also dealing with secret places. The third that we've been addressing was dealing with the method of study or the weeping for Tammuz. And now we're going to be dealing with those that have their worship more in the, in the papal manner where they are more turned toward the sun. Okay. So if you're going to take the four generations the, as like the first four churches, for instance, because those parallel the four generations. Okay. Uh, you're going to have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, and Thyatira is the fourth, and it's the papacy. Um, so you have this progression. A right? descent in that manner, yes. Yeah. Um, so here in in this, we're going to have, um, excuse me. So, so we're going to have some details brought up in this story. Um, one is you have Harashet of the Gentiles. So um, Harashet um, is a... <coughs> a woodland, right? That's the idea. And uh, it comes... Um, from a word that means carving or cutting. So we could look at this as related to idolatry. Right. Any other thoughts? No, I mean the way that the way you were beginning to present that makes sense. Yeah, I'm coughing quite a bit here, so it's pretty tough. Um, so, one of the things we looked at was these twenty years as a symbol as well, but. Anyway, if we go back to this idea as the four generations, I mean, we could we could take it that way. 
uh, we could take that each of these judges represent four periods in Adventism. But we're primarily making our application that this is talking about 2001 to 2023. But I thought as we we're looking at this with the judges, we're looking more at this as being a message as it relates to the movement, not so much with the, the, the future events. Right. So, so we have here that basically Parminder brings in a papal message. Correct. People accuse him of being a, a Jesuit, which I think... You know, I don't see any evidence that he had Jesuit training, but he definitely has Jesuit ideas. He's influenced by ideas wherever they came from that really are papal ideas. Uh, that is his view on economics, his views on uh, society. Um, these are papal concepts. Um, they're socialist. I mean, he's a socialist. So, and he's hiding that fact, which is something the Jesuits would do. He's in right. a movement that he doesn't agree with the conservative aspects of Adventism. And he finds this movement that um, he basically infiltrates that he's going to bring about his understanding of things, knowing that he can't present what he actually thinks, because if he does so, he wouldn't have any influence in the movement. And we saw this with Tabo as well. I mean, I lived with Tabo for a while, and uh, he definitely was not a conservative when it came to social issues, even, even back then. So, um, you know, his view on economics, his view on, on politics, all these things were quite, a, quite different than those that I had as being a libertarian. Uh, he definitely wasn't of that view. And now he did go to a Jesuit school. I don't think he was trained as a Jesuit because it was just a, a high school. And then he went to university in Newfoundland. Um, which was not a Jesuit university, but he still had this sort of thinking that people are, that, that, it, that basically pervades our society, especially our educational institutions. So people who are educated are much more likely to be socialists and to be socially liberal. So, so we see this understanding that, that's going to be brought into this movement. But it's first going to come on, under this cloak. And Sisera is going to be this general of Jabin, king of Canaan. And this is going to be the message of Parminder. But what specifically is the message of Parminder? more to accept the the social justice mentality than the items that that we have been addressing throughout this within the movement he sets aside anything having to do with prophecy everything is to be dealt with by feelings yeah now of course that, that happens gradually i mean parminder is going to present um, you know, the 2520 back in 2010. But I think it's in 2012 that he starts to make these secret alliances with, with others who are of a like mind. So Tabo is one of them. Um, Tess and her mother are another. Yeah. Well, and Tess not so much at first because she, she doesn't become interested in this until she starts to see the patterns because she has Asperger's and patterns are interesting for her. 
She's not really interested in studying the Bible or living a Christian life. She's just interested in uh, the patterns that she sees. But she takes a, um, a disguise that she's a conservative Adventist, but has not studied Adventism, doesn't understand a thing about it. Right? Doesn't know her Bible, isn't a Bible student. But she becomes this prophet in this movement. Right? So that's what ends up happening. So there's this whole deception that goes on, uh, both with, you know, Parminder and Tess. And Tess's mom and um, a bunch of other people who are pretenders. And, and so we see that happen when these people change, you know, it seems suddenly go, you know, a 180 in their belief system. Really, they didn't change at all. They just no longer hid what they believed. Would we agree with that? Correct. Yeah. Um, now, I'm marking this in 2014 that we're going to have Parminder uh, um, become prominent. Now, he's going to be ordained as an elder in 2016. Um, but he's going to begin uh, to have healed this, this um, relationship with Jeff by 2014. And, and he's going to start to become a champion of the message, particularly in relationship to 9-11. So... In 2014, we have, of course, people leaving the movement, but we also have Mark Bruce coming in, into the movement. And in some ways, we can we can sort of we can sort of pair Mark Bruce and Parminder together. Why why would I say that? That I don't know. They basically have the same message. Well, how did Mark Bruce come into this movement? Well, he came in through conspiracy theories. But and, yeah. who was it that brought him in? Well, I just thought Jeff brought him in. Emiliano did. Oh, Emiliano brought him in? Yep. Okay. I didn't know that. So he watched Emiliano videos then. Right. Okay. So the situation... Here is here is Emiliano that is also keeping a lot of things very secret. He is also supporting a lot of different portions within the movement. It is, you know, widely addressed that Emiliano had returned the message of Ezra 7-9 to its prominence. Yeah. Now, overall situation that we have, Emiliano brings Mark Bruce into the message. Mark okay. Bruce is accepted with this with Parminder, but all three of them have a, a very unspoken agenda. Well, they're all, in a sense, wanting to overthrow. They all want to be in charge of the movement. Correct. That's what I'm speaking of. Yeah. I mean, and Mark Bruce made that quite clear to me that he was going to be the next leader of the movement, that Jeff was going to retire and he'd become the head of FFA. Um, so he, he, the thing about Mark Bruce is he was not a skillful, as skillful as Parminder. Parminder was much more skillful in what he was doing. Mark Bruce was a little more impatient and just presumptuous. Parminder very directly said it's devious. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing that I found interesting is there was lots of gaslighting going on. Um, I know for me there was uh, accusations that I was, you know, trying to 
you know, take over other people's positions or seeking uh, prominence in the movement. And I was just interested in studying the Bible. I had no interest in ever being in charge of anything. Well, uh, I don't okay. like being in charge. When when you look at you look at situations in socialism. Yeah. Let's remember that in Russia with Lenin, mm -hmm. Vladimir Lenin was the leader. You had a, a cadre around him that included Stalin, but also included men like Leon Trotsky. Mm -hmm. Now, there were a lot of accusations that were made with Trotsky about how he was looking to overthrow Lenin. So he left Russia. He wound up in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, Stalin was the one that, that kept everything very close to the vest, but he was the one that secretly wanted to replace Lenin and wanted to replace all of the others. He wanted to be the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. Now, very bluntly, Parminder was exactly the same. Parminder wanted to live up to the, to the meaning of his name. What's his name mean again? God of gods. Okay. Yeah, now it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, you bring up this, this other history, but the thing about socialism, so, so I'm a libertarian, that is, I believe, and a lot of people don't know what that means, but I just believe that people, that the knowledge that exists in a large group of people is greater than the knowledge that exists in a single person. The idea that some group of people or some person can know what's best for other people um, is irrational. We can't even know what what's best for ourselves often. Um, so when it comes to the understanding of truth, my belief is that truth is best served by allowing people the freedom to study God's word and to make their own choices. And that if we were to, if one of us was to say, well, I'm the one who knows the most, so I should be in charge and other people should bow to my knowledge, you would be making a grave error because we only as individuals understand very little of what there is to know. But as a body of Christ, um, we can understand a great more and, and if you try to hinder others from studying, from asking questions, from seeking for truth, you end up on a track of error. And it, and, it, and it always happens. So no one, no matter how much we know, know enough. God knows all. And our trust needs to be in God. He is our head. No man is our head. No man or group of men can know as much as God. So in, in the world of economics, you know, no government can know enough uh, to make the decisions that the market can make. The market can, can cause all kinds of things to happen that man could never plan out. And so we trust that God is, is the author of truth and that he's the one who leads us into all truth. So when people try to seek to become, you know, the leader of a movement or the leader of a church, or they try to assert their power, they're actually robbing that power from God. So it's completely irrational what these people do but it's it's human nature right we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to and because of that we can't learn we can't grow we can't be corrected and instead anybody who tries to correct us well that person is quashed anybody who comes up with an idea that other people are listening to, we have to discredit that person.
because we want them listening to us because we know. And that's such a foolish thing. I mean, I just can never get my mind around why somebody would want to be in that position of authority, being the arbiter of truth. It's just, to me, it's insane. Can't, can't we make and see the same application with what was happening with the disciples? Yeah, we yeah, they were wanting positions of power. Right. Basically control other people. Because they valued themselves more highly than they should have. Exactly. Now, we are coming close to the close of today's time. Mm -hmm. What other I mean, we we've, we've got quite a bit here to look at just in the thought process of here here is a message, here is a movement. We have those that want to be the leaders. How many of them really wanted to be the servant? None. They all wanted, they wanted the top spot, but they didn't want to do what was necessary in order to earn the trust by well, being a servant. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, the point with this with Deborah and Barack that we're going to have to come back to when we when we meet again beginning on Sunday. Yeah. But I think we did a good job, you know, kind of going through what, um, you know, how these lines are lined up. Right. So so it should help us a little bit in our personal study on this, which I hope people are doing. And I should feel better by Sunday. I know I still got the Friday night study to do. And, uh, hopefully uh, tomorrow I get enough rest. But anyway, thanks everyone for the study. And uh, we can close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the light that has come and for the people that are seeking for light. We trust, Lord, that you know all things, that you foresee our needs, and that you have provided for them. We are thankful, Lord, for the prophecies of Scripture that guide our feet, and we are thankful, Lord, for all the things that you have done for us through the gift of your Son. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is needed to bring this conviction to us. Help us not to, to focus upon the sins of others, but to recognize our own sin. Uh, be with us until we meet together again to study your word. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.